the mic. Hosted by four-time Emmy-nominated producer Frank Bates and retired New York City firefighter, 9-11 first responder, and Vietnam vet. Today's guests, winner of CBS's Amazing Race, producer and host of the College Tour TV series, Alex Boylan. My brother. My brother Frankie, how you doing today, pal? Good. This is like the 93rd, 94th episode. It's hard to believe. How's your waggle? It's, it's wiggling. <laughs> <laughs> it's wiggling. You got a waggle, Frank. You can't swing without the waggle. You got a waggle. Yeah, it, it's wiggling. It's, <laughs> especially now at 72. I didn't ask you how your willy was. I was asking you how your waggle it's, was. Especially now at 72. Does your willy waggle? Yeah, well, yours does because you eat those fucking blue pills. It's quite a handful. Like M&M's, brother. I eat them like M&M's. Sometimes my hair looks like Don King. Everything gets stiff. <laughs> <laughs> I eat so many of them. enough to give everybody in this room a stiff. <laughs> no fucking problem. <laughs> uh, we we got to get to our guest. We got to get off this topic. We got a good guest. We got a good guest. We got a makeover guest, too. Alex Boylan is back. That's right. A repeat offender. I know, Frank. Really? Good to be back here. Thanks for having me back. And we have you in the flesh. It is so good. It's good to be here in person. Yeah, I'm so uh, you have had some success lately, as I noticed by the Land Rover you're driving here. Billy's what? driving his fucking Fiat, <laughs> <laughs> and, and you got a Land Rover. <laughs> I'm part of the talent, Frank. I'm the talent. <laughs> <laughs> a Land Rover, nice. Well, that's an old Land Rover. I've yeah. had that Land Rover all, over 10 years, if you can believe that. So No. Yeah. I mean, my wife's always telling me I get a new car, but they don't sell those. They don't sell that year that type of Land Rover anymore. They stopped making it in 2016. So it's old, but it probably costs me more money because it's old. Because every time it breaks, <laughs> it's a fortune to fix, but I love the car. It'll probably cost you. You probably make some money on it the way the cars are appreciated. I, I bet it would. I, I've said that. I, go, I bet I could probably get more money for it now than when I bought it like 10 years ago. Okay, well, so I'm going to pretty much bow out of this now. Because I got the two highest energy guys <laughs> that I've ever met in my life in, seated in the same room. So I'm delighted that take he Take it away. I didn't know Alex was coming into the studio. I thought we were going to be doing you on Zoom. Oh, this is so, so fun. So when they started rearranging the chairs, I said, what's, what's going on? What are we moving? What's going on? And then I found out you were coming in. But we are okay. delighted to have you. Oh, it's great. Yeah, yeah, because the, you, it only took the, me two days to drive over here from Venice. So, <laughs> you know, I, I didn't have it. That's I got a hotel downtown. <laughs> so. And and that's because it's that's because it's a weekend. That's right. That's if, right. If you tried to if we did this on a our, Monday, it might be a four day, you know, long weekend. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Well, we have you back because Billy Billy, tell us about your research on this project. Oh, that's yeah, that was interesting because when I was doing research on you, of course, you know, the Wikipedia shit comes up and all yeah. that stuff. But I want to get a little deep. I want to find out. Yeah, I don't, don't go too deep. What you had for breakfast. You know what I mean? Just want to, you know, get a little deeper. So I said, you know what? What am I, an idiot? Let me look at the first podcast we did with Alex. You know, you we were like the, the third or fourth one we did. And can I say congratulations? I mean, 96, is that where we're on right now? 93, 93. 93, where, I mean, the 90s. Congratulations. I mean, and one a week. That's amazing. Amazing. <laughs> I'm running out of friends. <laughs> <laughs> that's why you're back. <laughs> we're going back to the well. <laughs> we were running out of friends. That's when you got me and Derek to help me. That's why we're here. But yeah, so we were talking before you showed up about your energy. I said, this no, guy no, no, is always pitching. Wait, wait, wait. Pitching, fin pitching. Fin yeah. Finish the story first about Oh, what? yeah. So the reason. Holy I shit, said, let me do a little. Come days. on, Frank, my mind. You know, <laughs> kind of freelance, Frank. Wait a second. Look, look, look at that. Frank. Come on. <laughs> tell the story now. <laughs> so I said, let me do some research. And I said, what am I, an idiot? We got a podcast that we did on you last year. I yeah, said, let right. me look at the podcast. So I looked at the podcast and you were fine. What struck me. <laughs> Was how badly we suck. <laughs> Frank, I say nothing. I never shut up. And Derek's got editing mistakes all over the place. Oh my suck. god! Oh. Yeah, so I'm glad you gave us another shot. Oh my god! Any any time. It's always always a pleasure. So yeah. I'm I'm going to now sit aside okay. and let Alex. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, what's your name? Billy, yeah. Billy, between chews of the curd, interview. Uh, <laughs> it's a disease, Frank. It's a freaking interview, disease. Interview Alex. So be my guest. No, no, I'm just talking about your energy. Tell us what you're working on at the moment. Well, you know, uh, I'm I'm producing and hosting a show called The College Tour. Each episode tells the story of a different college campus across America, all told through the lens of real, authentic, um, real authentic students that are going to school there right now, and. What happened was a little over, this is pre-COVID, my niece, Isabel Polnazek, she's from Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin. 
she was given one trip to go take a look at colleges. And so she came out here to LA. And you know, I don't have any kids, so it was super fun. I'm taking her around to USC, UCLA, Loyola Marymount. And during that trip, she goes, Uncle Alex, you know, I really want to go check out some schools in Florida. I want to see some schools in New York. My sister, her mom, is here with us. And she's like, what do you think? We're made of money? And she's, yeah. like, you know, she's like, this is your trip. Like, this is it. And not long after that, COVID hit. So then I started helping Isabel online, try to you know navigate her path and try to find the right vibe and the right tribe of where she would fit in. And um, man, it's tough. I mean, there's there's you know it's three thousand in you know colleges across the country. Each one of them does a great job marketing, but if you go you know you go to their website, pages of pages of information. Nothing that you could just sit back and like travel around the country and learn about the different students and the programs and kind of more of like the culture and the vibe of a place. And man, we created this show. And if you can imagine, we're we're I just shot episode. We're we're in season six now, over fifty five episodes. Yeah, season six, fifty five in eighteen months. Yeah. And so. it all came serendipitously because. All was like a real, like just a real, it's the first time I always say, this is the first time, and I'm going to do this from now on, because this is my problem for the last 20 years. <laughs> um, no, it's the first time I've ever created anything that was out of a problem. Like it was a need out there. I kind of almost call it yeah. like infotainment. Yeah. It's like, usually it's like, oh, I want to, I, I want to go around the world. I'll create a show called Around the World for Free. This one was like a, a real problem that was out there. And, and you know, millions of other kids have the same problem. And so. to the younger demographic. Exactly. So they were hungering for what you were offering. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So What's really cool about that, what I think is really cool about it, is that when I was taking my daughter around, I took her to Penn State and I drove like hundreds of miles to get to Penn State. And then it was like Disneyland, like these... Phony people came up and told, "Hi, how wonderful!" You go right to the students. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. That's Appreciate cool. That. Yeah, it, it's funny. I was talking to someone the other day, and they went on a college tour. And by the third college that they were visiting, the 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 daughter, or whoever it was, who was telling the stories, is like, "Oh, wait for it, wait for it!" And they they knew what was going to come next. And it was almost like every school was doing this choreographed event during these campus exactly. tours. And so what we do. You know, we, we, we treat this like we treat any other show. We cast real students. We figure out, you know, what we work with the university. I almost look at like every episode's a mini co-pro, co-production with them. And so we're working with that university. A, what are the stories that we want to tell? And then we go out and cast it like we would cast anything else. And when we do cast someone, it's like, okay, we're going to tell the story of sports. And this is this, you know, person, student has a great story on that. The first draft of the script, we have the student write it. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Cool. And we do that just because it's like, if, if we, we don't want, this is not, if you watch the college short, it's not like some marketing piece. This is like, just, this is, you know, Jane's story who goes to Iowa State or whatever it is. And so we, we really try to stay authentic to, you know, that student's story. And you also find out, find out about the schools yourself. Why don't you sit, tell us what are some of the interesting, more interesting things you learned at your favorite schools yeah and it, I, I get the question all the time like what is my favorite school and it's hard to say because we you can't compare arizona state university or university of illinois or university of connecticut to florida tech or delaware valley university all these these tiny schools that right. are out there so to me i mean it's really fun no i i, I meant what not so much what was your favorite thing what was your favorite school what was your favorite thing that you learned at any of those schools what was my favorite thing? That's a great or, question. Or, or more, you, more unique things that you learned. Yeah. Um, I would say it's like Delaware Valley University comes to mind just because it's like this agriculture school that's like right outside right outside this town called Doylestown, Pennsylvania. Have you ever heard? It's like one of the most quintessential towns in America. That was really cool. Um, and just knowing, you know, that UC Davis, that's another awesome. Have you ever been to Davis, California? I've sent students there. Okay. Cause that, soccer players. That's a, that's a, that's a sleeper of a school. Yeah, the UC their, system. Their veterinary school is the veterinary school, the wine program there. Yep. You want to become a winemaker. That's yep. a great place to go. The town of Davis is like four blocks by four blocks. It's like, and it's about a half a mile from campus. So that's a great, so I think it's every school has, you know, we're actually coming out with a class, a college tour class where students can start even start learning how to figure out what is right for them. And because there's so much information out there, Frank, of how to figure out the university. And so we break it down like very simple into four steps. Location should be a big thing you think about because that location is going to be a piece of you for the rest of your life. Um, and do you want to be in a big state school or do you want to be in a 
yeah, think about Jackson University. We were just down there not long ago, and Jacksonville as a city is still home to me. I still go back there. It's, it's a city that could hold a lot of the, the students afterwards. So I'd say about a third of my class or my, the students I went to still live in Jacksonville. So well, I had a friend by the name of Phil Stone who was a broadcaster in Jacksonville. He later became an NBC broadcaster. And we talked about Jacksonville, and he said Jacksonville has a strange womb-like effect for all of us. Oh, yeah. And I, and I lived there afterwards. I lived there for years after school as well. So, And then we break by type of school, your major, and the culture of a campus. And so just trying to get you know young people, you know, once again, going through this with my niece and going through those challenges, if you go to some of these big ed tech, you know, and they're, they're fantastic. I, I'm not knocking on them, but the niches of the world, the Naviance, there's big ed tech out there. There's every institution. There's an overwhelming amount of information to type of, to try to digest. And I think for us, we try to break it down into story. And you know, we're I fortunate. think that's amazing. Like you're right. There's an actual need for that. Yeah. Have you ever had a student like say, uh, you know, go completely against the grace? I know this place sucks. Don't come here. No matter what you do, to school. We're, we're typically not <laughs> casting students that would have said that. We're casting students with great stories. I get that question though. I get that question a lot. No, we cast students that have great stories there. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's been an I mean, just unbelievable journey. And and I feel like I've been minimally preparing for this my whole career uh, with around the world free and different things. But I'm in two college campuses a week now, so it's a uh, I'm jamming. Well, you do eight. I know it, when you were at Jacksonville, you did eight interviews. How many days were you there? Okay, so at Jacksonville is an hour episode because obviously our alma mater got to get strong with that. So that's going to be nineteen different student stories. So a half hour episode is ten stories, ten students, each of them about two minutes long, and then hour episodes. When we do those, those you know just double it's twenty students, but in Jacksonville, I do a little uh, have a beer at the new boathouse uh, yeah. with the president. So. We oh, stole one of the segments to, uh, to do something. There. And, and Tim Koss is a great president and, and Unbelievable. a remarkable guy. He should be governor of Florida instead of the asshole they got there now. <laughs> uh, and uh, Tim's a great, he's a great fellow JU grad. He graduated in 81. Uh, he was a baseball pitcher there and he made his money in PepsiCo and a bunch of other places. And he's now running it the school out of, it has changed so much. I mean, in, in such a positive way. It, 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 I love. It was a. It was so emotional being back there. It was amazing getting to film my alma mater. We did that for around our fifty fifth episode. The last episode of season five will be Jacksonville University, and Tim, unbelievable, you know, CEO of, you know, ran big F Fortune five hundred companies and brought all that experience back to the university. And it, and it, and you see it everywhere. His first question was, and because a lot of you know institutions, a lot of times it's academic. But I personally, being in the business world, when a business person comes back and runs it, it just changes the face of it. Because his first thing was, students, what do you want? And the students were like, let's open up this river and have a beach. Let's do it, right? Every, and he just kind of listened. It's like, what would you, business person's going to listen to their client. What does the client want, right? What does the customer want? And uh, and Tim's done a great job of that. You can see it every in every little piece of the university. It's great. Yeah, so and I was, on a, I was on the board of trustees when we brought Tim in. Of course, Tim had been on the uh, board of trustees as well, and it was a big gamble. S some thought it would be a big gamble for us to take a businessman as president rather than an academic, mm -hmm. because Tim doesn't have his doctorate. Mm -hmm. Tim's just got a master's of business, uh, and uh, but he's got real success in the business community, and he has translated that success into a very successful university. Yeah, it's it, uh, it's. The university's changed. It's not the same university I went to. It's it's a much better um, university. You can see it. Even in the boathouse, you see all the mugs that are on there. He was telling me the story we were shooting there. He goes, all those mugs, we need an extra whatever it was, 200 grand to finish this building. So I got a bunch of mugs, went to all the alumni who wants to pay 10 grand right. for a mug. You get your first drinks on me for life. And so every little piece of that, he's finding a business solution to fix any kind of problem at the university. Really yeah. fun to see. That's great. Was this your first time back? So I've been back there once, um, probably five or six years ago. So I'd seen it start changing. Right. It's, I believe Tim's been in there 10 years, about a decade now. Almost 10. Yeah, yeah. about eight years. Yeah. So uh, really but, fun. But this this program that you have now, and successful, is wonderful. It's as successful as it is because it does fill a gap. I mean, I, I just from my two experiences doing it, mm -hmm. it definitely fills a gap. 
Well, you talk, but, about, you talk about when you took, took your daughter to Penn State. Yeah. Did your daughter take you to Florida at 58 years old? <laughs> <laughs> tell no, her, that was tell another story, that was like. Frank. That's another story. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, it does fill a need. But for our audience, whether they know or not, you've got wanderlust up the kazoo. I mean, you yeah. are – you are, you know, I got when a I first interviewed soul. you, you blew me away. You know, Thailand, South Africa, you know. Because that's me, man. I want to. I want to be on the road. So yeah. this is even a small, a, a condensed version, if you will. That now you're doing the states, yeah. as opposed to the world. I mean, I, I, I but you know, yeah, I've been fortunate to film in about seventy countries around the world, and have uh, and now well, let's, let's go before we get into that. Let's go back to the Amazing Race and how okay. you how how you use your wanderlust to compete and uh, maybe even win the Amazing yeah. Race. That was it, you know. I mean, I, that's what got me in this whole business, right. as you know, Frank. It, it's uh, I was an international business major. I was working in Boston, had nothing to do with any of this this world, and uh, but I hated my job. I hated my job in Boston. I couldn't stand crunch. I was a marketing analyst, crunching numbers. And uh, when the first season of Survivor came out, I was hooked. That was I was that's the first time I ever watched television. I was like, this is unbelievable. And it wasn't long after that that the Amazing Race hit, and a little pop up came on my computer, and a good buddy of mine that i grew up right down the street from chris luca i was like we gotta apply on this thing and i i've been fortunate my dad was a pastor so i i had traveled a lot as a kid so i had i had you know i i didn't go to disney world and sea world no we were like feeding the poor in like ishmael turkey so i was i had a global Whoa. global view growing up because of my dad and his position and what we would do and so um and then my my junior of high school i lived down in brazil didn't exchange down there so i had Definitely dabbled a lot prior to going into, but prior to this opportunity opening up. My junior year of college, I worked over in Germany. Um, took a took a year off and was slinging some drinks as a bartender down in St. John. So I had, I did that wonderlust was always there. And so when the Amazing Race actually became a thing, and this is the early days of reality television, you didn't really know what you're signing up for. The only thing you had seen was like the Real World on MTV and Survivor. So I got the first day uh first episode when amazing race back when we used to watch like programming at a specific time whatever it was wednesday eight o'clock chris and i were sitting down to watch the season one's first episode the phone rings and it was lynn's film at cbs being like you guys are on the next one so that's when we found out wow right. yeah yeah and what was that experience like for you i mean to obviously wanted to win so that was number one i, I grew up i didn't grow up with much once again my father's a pastor i'm one of four kids so to me number one was like I got a chance of winning some money here, million dollars on the line. Like, so that's, that's the ultimate goal is like win at all costs. I was pretty, Chris and I had said, we will do anything to like take home this grand prize. Uh, but quickly into it, I would say by episode three, I was, you know, I'm at, I'm 23 years old, years old at the time. I hate my job. You know, I'd quit my job in Boston. So I'm in this like flux time You're of my old. life. And, and so, but I'm watching these producers, they're inter interviewing me. CBS be like, Alex, stop asking the producers questions because uh, they're supposed to be asking you questions. Cause I was just floored by the production. Thousand people around the world hired to make that show pull off. And so I just fell in love with it. And so it was that moment. It was, so yes, I wanted to win, but the more important thing was I got exposed to the world of entertainment. And I was like, this is awesome. I'm getting, think about it. I'm getting to watch travel producers travel around the world for a job. I was like, this is the greatest job in the world. How do I go do that? So more importantly, after, you know, Frank was probably my first call because after Amazing Race, I was like, what's next? How do I get into this business? That was the beginning of it all. So let me tell you about that call. <laughs> cool. I'm, I'm in the office and the phone rings and says that Alex Boylan's on the line. So I had met Alex in 1988. When 98, 98. 98. Yeah. Uh, was it 98? 98. Okay. Yeah. Because I was at 88, school. 88 must have been your year in Germany. Yeah. Yeah. yeah 95 okay. to 99 was my years at JU. Okay. So, uh, and I met him as a soccer player. And I was, I had been a soccer player at JU and I had been a good friend of the coach. Uh, so I got to know him then. And he knew I was in Hollywood. So the phone rings and it's Alex Boylan. And I said, is it, is this frenetic voice comes on Mr. Pace, Mr. Pace. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I must have Alex, Alex Boylan's Mr. Pace. I said, "Yeah, Alex, what's up?" He said, "I'm I'm on this show called Amazing Race. It, it's I did good, but I can't tell you how good. But I'm coming to Hollywood. So you know, he was going to he was he had already won uh, his share of a of a million dollars. He won half half a million dollars, but he couldn't tell me. 
He said, but I want to come out there and I want to be in show business. <laughs> I said, okay, come on in. You'll do, you'll do great. And he was just this bundle of energy. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it was infectious. Oh, and, uh, well, it, I'm glad you're saying infectious. It could, you know what I mean? Not annoying. <laughs> well, <laughs> annoying at the time, but infectious also. <laughs> but uh, anybody has got the balls to call me in Los Angeles with so much energy and so much enthusiasm. I figured it was worth a shot. Yeah, well, I and a half a million dollars. Dude, that's yeah. I didn't know he had a half a million dollars. <laughs> but but I, I, I said to him, well, I know you wouldn't be calling me if you didn't do real well like one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I can't tell you because I, I took a cone of silence. <laughs> Yeah, but that, so then you got a calling. That was the day you really had a calling. I got so I what I want to do. Sure. It, it was like a light bulb went off. I mean, imagine it's like you don't, you, you know, when, when you're young. I mean, nowadays, young people are exposed to a lot more. Back then, you're not, you know, what are you exposed to? The only the world around you. There's no social media, websites not even around, and you know all these things. And so you're only exposed to what you see in front of you. So I, how would I ever be exposed to the world of entertainment? It's, you know. I was not in the, you know, wasn't like the movie business or scripted was my thing, but travel and adventure was a piece of my life. And now I'm on the show that that was what it was all based around and knowing that there is jobs in that world. And so that was it. Well, so. taking a generation before you, my generation, the first time I was ever on an airplane, I was 18 on my way to basic training. You had already been around the world by the time you were 18 from your background as your father as a pastor. Yeah, I, I was definitely. But, and I love those. I, I love like hearing about that because my... My great aunt, she was in the waves in the Navy, and she used to tell me stories of what it was like just to get to Hawaii. And I was fascinated by it because it was a train to Chicago, then another train out to San Francisco. I think it was like three weeks on the boat. And so, I, you know, yeah, yeah, every generation had, you know, different challenges to see the world. And I was just exposed because my father was a pastor. Well, I mean, just from New York to California, when I was a kid, it took 12 hours by yeah. plane. Yeah. Because there was a supersonic jets then. It's, yeah. It was 12 hours. That was the flight. So, yeah. yeah, it was a whole different world. But you had been, at 18, you had already been yeah, in Germany. I mean, by, yeah, by the time I was 18, my parents took us on this really cool trip. It was the last year that all of us would be under one roof. So I'm, I'm number three out of four. And my oldest sister, she's the oldest, she was about to graduate, or she, about, about to graduate high school, go on to college. Two years after that, my brother, two years after that, me and all that. So... So last year we're all together. So my parents took us on this just epic journey, pulled us out of school for like four months. And we started, I believe in Izmir, Turkey. Fortunately, my dad knew people. We were doing like Airbnb before it was a thing. And we traveled from, you know, all through Greece, Turkey, all the way. And we ended up in Scotland. Um, and wow. so, yeah. And so, and you know, I, I can remember school. It was a big deal getting out of school at that point. And I can remember my mom arguing with the school board. Cause like, he's gonna have to stay back a year. And my mom was like, his father has a doctorate in theology. We're going to be seeing the Acropolis. He's not reading about it in a book. Right. Like It's not like we're just going to be sitting around like on beaches. We're going to be doing some stuff, and he's going to get more experience out of this than sitting in the school. The great educator. Yeah. He's right. right. is the great educator. Don't Billy, what, what trip did you take in high school? I went to Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> Where'd I go? That was, that was after. He said, sign here. No problem. That we was, get to go to the airport. That was after high school. In high school, what trip did you make? Oh, I went nowhere. East side of the Bronx to the west side? <laughs> yeah. Nowhere. The, the, the 16 bus was my big day. <laughs> the 16, and smoke in the back of the bus. So the bus driver couldn't get. To, but yeah, but but you had this, this wanderlust. Always, yeah. And then you parlayed it. Yeah, very. Into, into reality television. I mean, around I, the world. For free, yeah, is a tremendous concept. Yeah, I mean that is. I, a I great keep thinking concept. about wanting to bring that back. I have a couple ideas on how to do it. Um, but anyway, yeah, I, I, I wanted. I just wanted. I, I was willing. After Amazing Race, I was willing to do anything. And I, as I speak to a lot of young people now in this next generation that's coming through, that's my advice to them because I, I literally was willing to do anything. Like, and and you can ask any. Ask Frank. At my one of my my key mentors, this guy, Jerry Smith, who I, who I really got the big opportunity after Amazing Race was to start hosting these shows back in Jacksonville, Florida um, for the small production house, but did travel shows. And, uh, but I started that first job for him. I get this call. Have I told you this story before? No. Okay. So I'm out here in LA. Frank's, Frank's, Frank's my only contact. Okay. So I'm out here in LA. Um, hustling, just trying to figure it out. I I gotten a job through Lynn Spillman, who was at CBS at the time, casted all the, the reality shows at CBS. She hooked me up with someone and I started casting for the show Blind Date. Remember the show Blind Date back mm -hmm. in the day, Little Bubbles, pretty funny. 
And so I, it was a great job. I mean, I'm 24 years old, living in Hollywood, go around to bars, find hot girls, cast them on the show. So it was a great job. Oh, yeah, man. It was awesome. But, that, but it was, I, I, wanted, <laughs> I wanted more in my career, but that was my first like actual job, paying job. <laughs> far as I would have went. I said, this is, I'm good here. Uh, no, no, you want maybe a bit? No, no, no. I'm, I'm good right here. People be like, what do you do? I'm like, it doesn't even seem like a job. I, I've somehow finagled that throughout my career. So that was my first, but I, I really, I, I wanted to do more, but I, you, you just can't see enough to understand enough in this business. That's why this business takes 20 years to be successful at it. Anyway, I get a call because two places called me their hometown kid. Jacksonville, Florida. I got extra press because obviously I went to school there. And then Boston, where it's where I was born and raised. So there's this production company, Pine Ridge Film and Television, at that time. And I don't know if you remember Great Hotels, Samantha Brown. But, I mean, they had some of the top shows on Travel Channel and Discovery Channels. And it just happened to be in Jacksonville, Florida. Yeah. So I get this call from a producer there. Uh, Christy Bolton was her name. And she's like, hey, you know, uh, we've been talking about you. You know, one amazing race. Um, we'd love to like maybe maybe have you host a show here. Obviously, my antenna goes quickly up. She's like, would you ever want to meet with us? I'm like, yeah, for sure. I'm in. You know, and that's my head. just like, of course, I'll do a show. I pretty much pack my bags. Like, I'm so excited thinking this is like, this is my end. My break. This is my break. I drive back to Florida because I'm like, this is like, this is happening. I drive all the way back there, show up for this meeting, and they start explaining to me like, oh, we have this show called Dare USA. And uh, I was like, I'm in. And like, well, you know, it's probably gonna take six months to develop. We just want to see if you're in. I'm like, well, I just drove here. Like, I'm in. And so they're like, <laughs> Alex, like, they go, the chance of a show actually happening from concept to, to, to actually go to air is like very small. And I'm like, and I look there and I'm, I'm in the room, Jerry Smith, who, who's the, the president of the company. I'm like, what do I need to do to come here every day? Like what do, I go, I'll sweep the floors. I, I, you don't even have to pay me. I'm like, I, I'm, I'm in the world, but I'm like, I, I just want to hang out here. And they had, they had a bunch of stock footage. One of their a little smart side business for them, but they had all this stock footage that they would sell to news stations at the time. And uh, they go, we don't have anyone that you want to sell the stock footage commission only. And they gave me a little office in the back. They gave me a book of all the news stations. And I was just slinging stock footage. And so that was my first job. But I loved it. I was sad. I was like, I, I loved it. I loved every second because I just got to, I'm still around talking, you know, talking to producers and I'm just starting to learn everything. And Jerry on his 75th birthday he always says, he's like, if Alex didn't sit there and say, I'm willing to sweep the floors, I never would have given him that job. And while I was doing that job, he started like, maybe like a couple of times a month, he'd take me into the studio and like, like fake host things, right, with me. And I thought I, was, I, I thought I hit the jackpot. <laughs> and they're probably like, Frank over here, like, who is this annoying kid? But he keeps showing up. So we'll, um, we'll entertain him for a little bit. And then there was a show called At the Chef's Table that they sold. Um, and they go, Alex, why don't you host it? And so I always say that all, you got to hustle and you got to kind of be willing to do anything, um, especially early on. To just kind of break in. And that's Enthusiasm. I think you had Rod and his wife on at the chef's table. Yeah, yeah, yeah he did. Did yeah, you? Did. One, one of those sessions? Yeah, I think it was out here. It, we yeah, did an episode in LA. It, it had to be at, at out okay. here because if it wasn't <laughs> within 10 miles of his house, Rod wouldn't have gone to <laughs> okay. it. Yeah, <laughs> Rod Carew, that that's is. right. That's right. But your enthusiasm uh, was unbounding. I, I mean, think they, so, yeah. and they see that. Yeah, and, and I was willing to do anything. I was just, and I wasn't. I was, I was just, I was excited. I was a young kid excited in the business and just ready to go. And that, so that is really the start because that, those five, I spent five years, probably did about five different shows. And because I was so excited, I mean, I'm sure the crews early on was like, why is this kid always hanging out? Because I would hang out with them when they were show, go sheet B-roll. They're like, you don't need to be here, Alex. I'm like the host of the show. I'm like, that's fine. I'll help you. I'd be like carrying bags for them. And then when I would go back at ed the editor's, except this one gentleman, Jolt Luke, who's one of my like best friends, colleagues now, I would sit in the edit phase and the editors would be like so nervous and like, can why are you here? Because like the host doesn't sit in there. But I was just so like, how does this whole thing work? I didn't go to school for this. So I'm learning everything. And so I was just willing, I just, and so I would talk to the producers and they'd be like, yeah, do you want to help write? So I'd just start writing. And I'd just start, I would just start taking jobs on to take work off other people's plates because I loved it. That's great. Frank yeah. often talks about that, even in lips, uh, to be flexible. If you're going to be in show business, learn every aspect of it. Learn Why not? Because you don't know. Exactly. Like, you know. Well, Alex told Alex put into words what I had thought all, it, uh, all along, 
when we were in, we were at Jacksonville one time, maybe ten years ago or something, when we were speaking to film students, mm -hmm. and some kid asked Jack, asked some student asked asked us, you know, what do I have to do to be successful? And Alex said, go wherever you can find a job. Yeah, doesn't make any difference where you are if you want to do something and there's an opportunity for you in Alaska, go to Alaska. Yeah, you know, yeah. wherever it is, just go, and that. Hundred percent. It's, it's like it, it's like when that crack in the door opens up, you yep. got to bust that thing down. Yep. You know, and and the old adage is always true. It's like be the first one there, be the last one to leave. Even if you got nothing to do, uh, just letting people see you like you're still there. You're in it to win it. Actually, for the first uh, twenty five years of my career, <laughs> I was always the first person in the office and the last person to leave. Yeah. I wanted I wanted a young PA coming in to see me there, and I wanted to be there when they left what was your first job frank my first job yeah i was how'd you get in this business oh that's a long, a long story, story. A, a long i mean story. I, and i know i've heard it but i don't it's a it's a these lips can talk ladies and gentlemen <laughs> the answer, the answer yeah, is right, right. There. I, I, and I brought a copy because <laughs> i want to get a personal signature from both of you the answer is there yeah I, I started out as a as an assistant buyer for the may company so that job lasted 10 months and then i got into the world football league and Okay. I just where, I can remember you telling me something that you were you selling sneakers on the lot somewhere. I was well <laughs> when I was an advertiser, okay. I was Pony was my account. Okay. And I got my first show by uh Bay City Blues, which was a Stephen Botsko show which starred oh, Dennis Franz and Michael Nuri and uh what what, what the heck was the, the, the woman's name? Big Sharon Stone. Uh, uh -huh. oh. it was a good a good show. It lasted seven episodes. <laughs> his his follow up. But I remember uh, her close up, Mr. DeMille, Sharon yeah. Stone's close up. And uh, I went to give them pony shoes and they said, uh, well, do you do you know anybody? Can you recommend anybody that would be a baseball consultant for us? I said, Hey, I played college baseball, I'll do it. And that's how I got into show that's business. Awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. We had the president of Warner Brothers on a couple of weeks ago. 50 years, president of Warner Brothers Worldwide, Steve Papazian, started out as a male boy in, at Warner Brothers. Yeah. And the president for the studio. And, and, I think, and I think that's probably the biggest misconception of this business is thinking that it's handed, it, it, that magic just happens. It is old school hard work. And I, I say, because I've had a lot of like fun in this journey and a lot of exciting things that I've done. So I don't want to say it's, but College Tour is the fastest biggest hit i would say i've ever had that's great man. and i and i, I think about because there's an adage out here people say it takes 20 years and you know how long I, i've been in this business 20, 20 years, exactly years. 20. And, and it's a lot of, it's like the college tour I won't go into it now but like it, it there's like tons of tiny pieces as i look back in my career that i was learning and being set up for the right opportunity at the right time and to be able to have the relationships, to be able to scale it, to be able to build the production, execute it, have the trust, all the things. That, there's no way I could have done this in my 20s. No way I could have done this in my 30s. I needed all like the ups, the downs, the failures, the connections to, to be able to kind of run. Yeah, I, right. I disagree with you a little bit uh, <laughs> because when you were doing Hell's Corner or What's Cooking with Alex, I don't think that there was that great a need for the yeah. American people to know what you wanted to cook. <laughs> True. There were probably better people that could tell you what you wanted to cook. Yeah. But when you got into something that reflected on a need and how you could f fulfill a need, mm -hmm. that's when you clicked. Yeah. So had you found, discovered that 10 years ago, you probably had known enough to be successful. Yeah. 10 years ago as well. Yeah, there's, there's a format to this. And, and I kind of was playing around with some other ideas prior to College Tour hitting. But it's def I found like the perfect thing for me. I, and I mean that from like top to bottom, the production, how to how to make a bunch of episodes mm -hmm. and not have the network in control, uh, how to have the team, like every little, pe you know, a lot of my shows, it's all been small crews. So I'm not, I don't have experience like Lisa Hennessy, who's an executive producer on, on this a good friend of mine, business partner. I mean, she's run Survivor and, you know, like Biggest Loser. Those are like thousand person teams, world's toughest race. I'm the guy that you give me, give me like two or three awesome people. I'll come back with the show. Like I was, I've been that guy for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And so fine tuning and as technology is almost caught up with that now th that, and we wouldn't be able to make the show. With it just wouldn't work with the big crew out in the field. I mean, it's only four people who go out there and, and execute for the week to get the, the show done.
and that's where you usually spend that week on campus? I mean, I'm, uh, JU, I, I spent every day just because it meant so much to me to be back there and, and wanted it, obviously, it, you know, perfect. But the, the crews are great. So I'm, I'm usually on campus for a day. And you were there in the springtime, so you got to see the uh, top 20 men's and women's lacrosse team. Top 20. Unbelievable, in right? Yeah. They're on the cover of lacrosse magazine. Yeah. I was, funny story, I'm sitting outside about to do... Because my um, my role in the show on camera is I'm kind of like the facilitator. I'm the host. And I'm tossing it. Now we're going to go meet this junior, and they're going to tell, tell the story about lacrosse, what have you. But while they're setting up for that, I was getting out of the sun. So I'm sitting right next to the Howard building, just mm -hmm. kind of collecting my thoughts and getting things together. President Cost, we had just filmed earlier today. He sees me out his window. So he comes down and sits down next to me. It's pretty. Someone grabbed a picture of it. It's pretty cool. And um, we're hanging out, and the athletic director walks up while we're there and I'm just starting to learn about how awesome this lacrosse program is. The coach is like world famous and where it's going. And he's like, look at this. And Jay, and then he's holding up the magazine that Jay, you made the cover of it. So yep. pretty cool. Yep. And the coach is John Galloway with the men and Mindy McCord with the women. Yeah. Great people, great coaches. Uh, they got to go in there. They're going to yeah. probably, you know, do what we were doing in soccer in the, in the nineties. Yeah. Uh, they'll do it this year. Yeah. Or next year or the year after that. Yeah, it's awesome. Outside of your affinity towards Jacksonville, because you went there, obviously, an alumni, and you traveled around the country, what college surprised you the most? Like when you got there, you were expecting it to be like, a, you know, a, some hick town or something. And then you said, wow, this is really a Well, cool by the time I'm showing up, you know, our production, it's about six months for every episode. So there's too much of pre-production. I, I, so I have a good idea of what's going to happen you know, we're down to the T of what is going to happen. So by the time I'm in the field, I, I, we know a lot, you know, everything about the university. Um, but I would say Fort Lewis, episode one, season one, Durango, Colorado, 1600 students, beautiful university on top of this mountain, in the middle of this mountain town. Who would have thought? And and you got right, there's hundreds of colleges like that, but that was just surprised me. Um, My nephew went there. For, oh really? For really? one for one semester. Oh really? <laughs> His freshman year. Yeah, it's like the it's the perfect school. If you're if you're like a snowboarder, half I don't want to say hippie, but like if you're just you know it's a great it's a great institution. But it's if you're an adventure, that's a great school to to be in. Funny Very story cool. about that first episode. First episodes of anything, as we know, <laughs> are always the trickiest, right? You just don't as, know what as, you're doing. As we know, <laughs> right? Yeah, as you know, right? <laughs> It's you just don't know. You just don't know what you're getting into. You don't know how it's all gonna pass. So this is like my brainchild. It's in my head of how we're gonna make this show. Um, Lisa had connected with Mike Murray, who is the DP on Survivor, and he runs a big studio in Orlando. So that's where we crewed up on all this. But everyone's kind of coming in. We got this thing going. Everyone's looking to me. Of, of, I'd say of anything I've ever done in my life in the sense of like, what are we doing? Is this, how are we making this show? So this is in my, this is my head. We show up, fires in, fires are all over Colorado. So it's just like the whole campus is full of smoke. It's co heavy COVID time. So we can't film any student inside without wearing a mask. Then the hail storms, like every oh. single thing that could go wrong, nailed us on episode one. We've never had such a challenging time to make a, to make a show, but that was in Fort Lewis and Durango, Colorado. And um, the whole team, they're, they're amazing school, amazing people over there. And of course you withstood the locust, when the locust came and infected the camp. <laughs> almost, I mean, it, was, it was almost, it was almost, it was almost. We, we learned a lot in that first, uh, in that first episode, but. And uh, has any schools disappointed you? I mean, you're expecting more from it. Uh, and I know I'm going to yeah. pin it down and get you a little trouble. Yeah, with no. I, like, I, like Donnie Hammond did, he do, who wouldn't name whoever was a prick in the golf tournament. <laughs> oh, you know, I, mean, I would he, say, I mean, every school, every school is different. And, I'm at, and once again, this is a co-production. It's not like the college tour walks in. And it's like, everyone move out of our way. We're going to do our thing. Right. We've been in lockstep with this school from day one. So as soon as we're like, okay, we're going to make an episode at, uh, Arizona State University, it's two months of our teams getting to know each other once a week production calls. And so we're, we're really, tr we're the way I look at college shows, like we're steering a ship because we know how to make an awesome, we know how to make great content. We know how to make great TV, but the university knows their story. And so we really become like one close family, but it's people and people. And so I'd say that's the biggest thing of our, I, I think this is the exciting part about making our show in a couple different capacities. One, you know, when you're, 
after you've done 20 episodes of something, everyone knows the rigmarole. And in a weird way, it can kind of become stale in a certain way, right? Because it's like everyone knows what this is what we're going to do next. This is what's going to happen here. Here, every episode, it's a different team, you know? So that's kind of exciting. And, and our directors, we went and cherry picked our, our pe favorite people to kind of be the directors of each one of these episodes. And I was worried to that, is this going to become stale? Is it going to become the same thing? How do we keep this like energized and exciting? But because every time you show up and that student, no matter how much they've gone through the media training and gone through getting ready, you never know what you're going to get. Every single day, you do from one second, okay, Frank was awesome. Oh my gosh, I think Billy's going to be great, but he's nervous as anything. And so you just never know what you're going to get. So that, I, I believe, keeps our field team on their toes because no matter what, as soon as you think something, you'll figure out really quickly you're wrong. So... That's what's been fun. But, but I'd say the most challenging, every school is awesome. And our job is to really tell their authentic story, but it's people, you know, yeah. and people got different personalities. But, so that's usually where there's teams out there that I've worked with. And I, and I, I really know the people really well from the first like five to 10 episodes, because that's where I was heavily in the field and directing, figuring out all the nitty gritty. It's been a long time. It's, you know, it's been probably four seasons now of me not having to handle the production in the field. Um, so there's, 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 there's some people in the in, in the in the early days that I just I'll never forget. Fort Lewis, NZ Nike's quiz. I'll never forget it. I mean, it's just people who trusted us were working early on in this process. Um, Arizona State, episode number two. And so th there's there's these memories I'll have that I'll never forget. Delaware Valley University. That's another one that the team's spectacular. So was that a big deal for you to get Arizona State as a number two show? It's really if you think about it, season one you know, not knowing where this was going to go, getting ASU was big, mm -hmm. big, 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 because just the name brand behind them, uh, that was huge. But it wasn't long after that, the University of Illinois, boom, they were in. And so that was another hit. <coughs> and it wasn't long after that. So in season one, we had ASU, University of Illinois, and the University of Connecticut. Three big names that I think, if, if you didn't have those three pillars, um, would this have taken off the way it went? Because we, and we don't want to just tell big state schools. We want to tell the little school stories. Sure. Right? We want to tell everyone's story. That's our goal is to tell the story of every college in America. But um, having those big institutions get behind this and believe Gave in you our cred. team. Massive street cred. Great, great. Yeah. So you win the amazing race at 24, 23. You're given a check for a half a million dollars. What's the first thing you buy? A house in Jacksonville Beach. <laughs> And Frank, interesting story. <clears throat> I can tell you the whole story. That, that's a good investment. That was now. a real good investment. It was. Well, so Chris and I, that's all we did with race money. Like all the race money we, we cause I'm now back in Jacksonville working at Pine Ridge. Chris had like met a girl down there. Now has two beautiful kids and a family with her there. So Chris, my buddy from Boston who went to school at Clemson is now living in Jacksonville, Florida. So we're both down there. Um, and we just, oh, we'll buy a house at the beach. That sounds good. And then we bought another house and it, we were, so what is this? Like 2005, right? Ish. It's before the housing boom. So we thought we were like the, you know, Donald's it's before the housing crash and then boom. No, no, boom first. Right. Okay. And well, I wouldn't say it depends how boom you want, but I mean, it's going like this. Yeah. We were in early where. Oh my gosh, this is so easy. This is great. And so at one point in time, we owned like seven, we were way over leveraged. I had owned four. like seven or eight places. And we made one move downtown that like almost took us completely, wiped us out. So 2008 hit. Oh, I got a big spanking. I almost had to start from scratch. I mean, Chris and I got walloped by being over leveraged. You know, we all know the story of what happened there, but we got hit, hit pretty hard. Held two places in Jacksonville out of the beach. Sold one place like five years ago, but held on to one little tiny place uh, in Neptune Beach on Margaret Street. We just closed on it yesterday. Just sold it yesterday. For six figures? Oh, yeah. Seven figures. Oh, yeah. Uh, close. Yeah. I mean, like, so that one place that we held on to made up for all, all our mistakes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I was in that boom, too, when I was down at the homestead. I said, you know, I'm just going to buy a house. I, I know. But, but in Florida, a lot of people don't know, there's three insurances. You got to pay for wind, you got to pay for flood, and then you got to pay your regular insurance. Yeah. You got four houses, you're paying 12 insurances. Yeah. But in any case. Yeah. We, I, I learned a valuable that. lesson at a young age. And so. Back to your show, what yeah. interests me the most about it is if you're doing the faculty, obviously, they're going to have a scripted thing. Why is this university so cool? 
Why is this university the place you want to go to? It's scripted. It's them. It's the faculty. It's their job. You're hitting the students. For sure. I think this is the first time we're getting peer-to-peer -peer conversations. I mean, think about it. a high school. When you're in high school, what do you who do you look up to? Who, what do you want to be? A college student, right? If you're 16, you're like, man, I want to be 19. I want to be in college, right? Everyone. So for us, it's like we're getting peer, we're we're getting these two demographics that are separated, right? High schools are separated, you know, for all practical purposes to college students. And we're getting them to have communication. I think so. I think our show does that. This is the first time that's ever really happened. So it's college kids selling. This is my story. So students are not only just learning about the institution, they're learning about majors. I mean, think about, I mean, at least for me, I didn't know, I chose international business out of a hat. I was like, I like to travel, that sounds cool. <laughs> I knew zero about it. And so what's fun, I think for high school students now, they can sit there and be like, oh wow, criminology, that's pretty cool. Like, oh wow, there's like, you know, farming is a business, that's cool. Like. There's just so wine many majors tasting. out there. Yeah, I want to be a winemaker. That sounds awesome. I read combustible. I want to be a fireman. Yeah, yeah so I, th I think that's like a really fun thing for high school students now is I can look up, I can see someone that's only a few years older than me telling me their real authentic story. Where do they come from? What are they interested? What does my life look like right now? And they can quickly be like, yeah, that's what I want. And I like that school. So. Just yeah. great. I think it's to do yeah. Great. So they can, I mean, the average college once again, the average college trip for a family outside their immediate area is twenty five hundred dollars. So think about how many students, millions of students here, millions of families, they can't afford to go around and travel around the country. You know, and so most, and if you think about it, the average student, can't really see the average. I'm talking about the average student. They can't see beyond their own peripheral. What's around me? What's in my grabbing the elephant's her? tail? Yeah, and it's like, you know what? There's a big. We're very blessed to live in the United States of America. Yeah. You got different demographics. You got different topography. You got different, all these different things. So find your vibe, find your tribe, and now you can, you know, fortunately, do it from your phone or from the television. But I mean, anybody of college age just looking at schools would be out of their mind not to not to check oh, out yeah. your show. Yeah, yeah, I mean, out of their mind, and they'll look back at the. Go ahead. No, not look back at the previous shows. I mean, you want to see yeah. every taste of it. Yeah, it makes yeah. sense. How can, you, how can we find a show? Uh, multiple. The easiest place, thecollegetour.com. Uh, that's where everything's the most current. Uh, also, the College Tour app, is, and that's also a streaming channel now on Apple TV, Roku, a number of different, you know, probably 16 different platforms now. So the College Tour is where you're going to see the most, like, that's the first level of delivery, right? So when the show's done, it's going to go there. We also deliver as a season for season drops to Amazon. So it goes to Amazon, IMDb TV, which is now Freebie. They just rebranded a couple of days ago um, to all their, their distribution channels, as well as Fox's streaming channel, Tubi. So one thing is it's no matter where you watch it, it's free. So that's a big thing for us. Even if on Amazon, there's ads thrown in it now, which is offsetting, um, allowing it to be free for anyone. So you can go watch the college tour. Anywhere you want to watch the college tour, it's free. Okay, so I'm going to ask you, how do you make money on this? Well, you're asking a good question. So we partner with the universities, Frank, right? And so there's a financial commitment from the university in order, and we take care of production in that, and then we take care of distribution. So those, and, and, and a little bit of marketing. So there's like, but really it's like we're taking, it's, it's a six month endeavor, and it's a university. We, we, we find the universities that we want to work with. Our partner team is always looking for schools, but there's going to be a financial commitment. Someone's got to pay for it. So, but on top of that, the university gets to use it for all, you know, marketing PR purposes. Whoever's going to pay for it owns it, really. You know, when you think our how we look at media. And so early on in this, because this is a good question, when the idea hit, how were we going to make this show? And, and honestly, like the, the, the model was an important part because the first couple of conversations I got into, uh, it was very quickly realized the university is no way they're going to have the network be like, oh, we like this person. We don't like that person. Take them out of a green shirt. Put them in, you know, imagine if the network's in control, the network's in control. And so the only way to do that was to reverse it a little bit and have the universities pony up the cash in order to produce it. We will handle all production services, you know, from pre-production all the way to post, as well as um, network distribution. So the university's angle for putting up the money is just the PR of being on yeah, I mean, every, I, there's all kinds of different reasons now. Like, why would a university want to do? I think every university wants to do this, and, and we we're we're at the capabilities to do two episodes a week, which puts anywhere between like 30 episodes in production at different stages of production. So that's what we're built for right now. In a, in a year or two, we might be able to do three episodes a week. So there's only so many we could, you know, humanly possibly do. But um, I think most importantly, story, like is why university, I think at the end of the day, it's like a third party coming in and telling your story, uh, I think is probably number one, but everyone's different. So some universities are like, yeah, 
you know, there's a demographic cliff coming. I don't know if you all know that for a university. So there's there's a demographic cliff coming for so the amount of students that are actually going to college is about to drop big. And so there's just, I need applicants. So especially the smaller schools, it's like, I need applicants. Other ones, it might be their yield, meaning that student was accepted, but we lost them. Where did they go? And so imagine now having content, premium content from Hollywood producers delivering that story out to them to help push that yield. And you give them great distribution, and which, which they couldn't get on their own. Could never get they, on, yeah. they could have made a, a show sort of similar, yeah. a half half as good, yeah. but they couldn't distribute it. Yeah. So what good is it? Yeah, you, and, 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 pay and, a little and more. just on the whole, like, could they do it? Because early on, I mean, I, 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 and this is a big, like, thanks to our production team, but, you know, there's many, many schools that have big media teams, right? I mean, these big state schools, I mean, they're, they're big businesses. And, and every single one of them will come afterwards. They go, at the beginning of this, besides distribution and everything else you guys add to this, I, we would have thought we could have done this. It happens like that. They go, Whoa. at the end, they're like, no way we could have done this. Yeah. It's not when everything's going great. It's when the shit hits the fan. And we see how your team reacts and fixes things. Is <laughs> is so there? It, it, and I don't want to knock media teams because there's great media teams out there, um, out of these big schools. Uh, but there's a lot of time, small schools. They don't have anyone. I mean, they don't even might not even have a videographer. So, and there's other reasons too, Frank. It's interesting. Like the, we've had a lot of universities that like I don't need applicants, you know, but they maybe want a different type of applicant, mm -hmm. or they want to engage their alumni, you know, or they're doing some big fundraising campaign. So they're recruiting athletes. You know, Mike, funny story here. Mike Miller, who's uh, played soccer at, J he was a goalie right, at, right after my year at JU. He was the head coach at UConn. This is when we were filming at University of Connecticut. So Mike and I go out for, uh, he, Mike has no idea what the college tour is. There's no idea about it. So we're out to dinner. He's like, so what are you doing here? And I'm like, well, I got to show you. It's awesome. It's called the college tour. So I'm playing him an episode of the college tour. He's like, this is amazing. So the next day, he sends me a picture. He has his whole staff watching the first episode, Fort oh, Lewis, wow. of the college tour. So he has everyone watching that and uh, has them watching that episode. He's like, I'm going to use this for recruiting. This is like the best recruiting tool in the world. Yeah. I, mean, we, I mean, it's you know, UConn's a top 10 program. And so it's kind of funny. And then I went over there and saw they just spent like $40 million on unbelievable new facilities over there. So, so from recruiting athletes... There's just to, so many pieces. To recruiting band members, to exactly. recruiting it's, mathematicians, to recruiting you're exactly chemists right. and biology people. Yeah. Now, you, you kind of, they still call themselves the fighting insurance salesman, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I always, I always tell people, knowing now, you know, knowing now, and, and, and the emails, I'll get emails from presidents of universities all day long. They're saying, hey, you have no idea what how this changed, like, our, our helped our university. And, and uh, aspects that I never whether it was from a fundraising campaign that they were doing or X, Y, and Z that we just would not. And so I always say like, I wish I could say I was that smart ahead of time and thought for it, but it was a very simple idea. My niece couldn't figure out where to go to school and didn't have the money to go travel around the country. But now we're finding that the college tour is doing so much more, just the morale after these last two years of COVID and you know what I mean? And people down and working, you know, or, or studying remotely in a way. It's like the college tour, I mean, it, it's like a good shot of adrenaline for that university for that for those six months and for years later i uh, arizona state uh, uh, cindy i mean she wrote me the other day and she's like you know where that's epi that's episode two season one and she's like it's it's still palpable the episode you know so it's an evergreen episode really cool. it's still now two years from now and we're still seeing the rewards the excitement from doing it so that's yeah. great and you mentioned that they, they, they think they could do it themselves uh, invariably, I've, I've lectured at a lot of universities, and I always open up the last 20 minutes to, for questions and answers, uh, because I always know what I want to say, but I don't know what they want to hear. Yeah. So to make sure I know what they want to hear, I answer their questions. And invariably, the I don't want to say dumbest questions, but the least intelligent questions always come from the professors, because the professors aren't state of the art. The kids are state of the art. And they ask questions that mean something. The, you know, the, the professors invariably are there for the wrong reasons. They're there because they want to get out of there, mm -hmm. or they're there because they have no place else to go. Yeah. And they left. But like, like if I went back to college and taught, now I couldn't teach television now, even though I'm working in it still, 
because when I was producing, I was producing like from 1986 to 2018. The world has changed so, so much, much in the last 10 years. Even what I knew, I don't know anymore. You know, it's funny. It's funny because now that I'm in this position and I'm, I'm speaking at colleges all, whether I'm there hosting for the day, I go talk to speak to some classes or I'm, a lot of times I'm coming back for premiere parties and speaking to students. And, and I really loved it. This is the biggest, I would say, and I don't want to call it a mistake, but at, especially film, television, arts and entertainment students, they're always afterwards going like, here, take a look at my portfolio. And I, so I think if I was teaching a class or my advice, you know, downstream is I'm like, okay, what am I supposed to look at here? And like, I don't have four hours to look at all of your stuff. And so what I'm giving every student now for advice is like, what do you want to do? You want to direct or do you want, what do you think you want to do? You want to host? It's like, you have the ability with YouTube now, go figure out one thing, one thing. And so I, I gave this, who did I tell him this the other day? Oh. This girl's talking to, she wants to, she loves finance and she loves, uh, she came from a underprivileged background. She had to figure out finance on her own. And she wants to give that information back to under, like, that's where a real passion is. I'm like, you don't need to wait for anything. Start YouTube right now and do five minute episodes, just like this podcast, just like anything else. And do that over and over and over. And by the time you're out of college, now you show, it doesn't matter what you want to get into. Like, Hey, I did, I did, I did 500 episodes or a hundred episodes of this financial class. You don't need to say anything more. I got the idea. And the fact that you did that a hundred times, it's like, yeah, come work for me. Right. And, and I, and it doesn't matter. It's like, so I, I, my niece wants to um, be the next Aaron Andrews, my wife's, my wife's niece. And I was telling her, I'm like, listen, start doing one minute interviews with every single student athlete at Virginia tech brand it something you're going to get become a better interviewer you're going to have to learn how to shoot a little bit better you're going to have to coordinate with someone else to potentially edit this thing but don't don't start doing like a little short film don't do it that's what you want to do do that thing 250 times you show that to espn when you're out be like hey i did this 250 times you're like yeah you're you're for real is that that's my biggest thing that i'm noticing is that and i understand they might not know and they want to learn but sometimes they're just doing all these different things to all these worlds it's like what do you really want to do? Just do that thing over and over and over and over again. And by the time you're out, you got that's a that's a portfolio. You could give your pitch in two yep. seconds, and it doesn't matter where you want to go from there. I understand what you did, and I st the the fact that you had the fortitude to do that over and over and over again. I want to hire you. Yeah, when I interview a person uh, and they come in and they say, "What do you want to be?" and they say, "Well, I'm not sure whether I want to be a director, actor, producer, writer." I said, "Well, why don't you go back and when you do." decide what you want to be, come see me again, because I don't have time for, I can be a, do this, 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 and this. Yeah. There are a lot of people competing against you that have wanted to be a director all their life. So that's, if you're 18, 22 years old, they've probably been working at that for 14 years, yeah. or, or being a writer for 14 years, or being an actress for 14 years. So you're competing against some really talented people. So go back and decide what you want to do, and then come back and tell me what you, when you know. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, Frank says that all the time. Shh, don't don't talk about it. Shh, don't shh, tell. Do it. Yeah. Do it. Do it. Do it. Go do it. And and now, I mean, what a great because, you know, I mean, you know, listen. When I started this business, if the door wasn't open, if that crack didn't get in, you can't get in. Right. There's just no way. It was just no way to get in. Now there's zero excuse. There is. You yeah. know what I mean? I mean, what you yeah. can do on this phone now and yes. on your computer, you can create your own content. David Scott told us that these computers, these phones have a hundred thousand times more capabilities than the computers that sent them to the moon. Yeah. Unbelievable, it's right? Incredible. It's incredible. I remember being in the service. I was a computer operator and, and I was operating in a room uh, eight times the size of the studio. Unbelievable, and right? And all we could do was accounting. It was, it was an ad yeah. machine. That's all it was, really. Yeah. Well, <laughs> especially, you know, five years ago, we couldn't have done this podcast. Yeah. I mean, we couldn't do it. For, we, could, we couldn't do this podcast today without Derek and his technical ability. But uh, makes you long for the past, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but that's you know, I mean, we do this, and you know, we don't come out of pocket for very much at all. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah but you get, but you did it, man. You do it. I, I, I got to tell uh, our audience, just as I'm doing research when you were doing uh, around the world for free, which yeah. is a great concept, you know. 
especially for all you guys that use both sides of the toilet paper out there. You know, if you're a little tight between you, you don't want to spend much money, like you're about a dollar a day type thing, you know. But I mean, as I'm reading, it says, from, then I went from Chile to South Africa, I hung out with the band called the Dirty Skirts, and then uh, from Nairobi, uh, I ended up, just before I went to India, of course, I was in Nairobi. I love the way it reads, you know. Well, it, it, was, it was such, you know, for, for the audience, you know, the around the world, for one person had to make it around the world using the help of the online community. And at that time, this is pre Facebook. This is YouTube's just coming out. So it's just a, it's an early idea of a concept. And who was that one person? So season one was me. <laughs> <laughs> I had to make sure it worked. Uh, the idea worked. Uh, but that, a, a, that was, I mean, because that was something, uh, another thing I talked to students all, a lot about is like, you know, everyone in this town told me no. Like, like twice. You know, I mean, I, I no, no one, I mean, everyone kind of like liked it, but it just couldn't get it over the goal line. And then one, well, I got this one crack at the CBS early show where they were like, hey, we'll follow your journey. And that's, that's what, you know, I felt like I hit the lottery when, when that happened. But yeah, one person, and the whole idea was at that point, I'd been hosting shows for probably five or six years and I loved my life. But I was also seeing, even in the world of a travel show, it's not contrived, it's a little set up for me. And I and I knew, and did I tell this story in the last one of like- uh, Tell it again. Okay, because Jolt, I think Jolt listened to something. He's like, "You're wrong, Alex." Because I always say, "Is Jolt Luca the guy who Jolt traveled, Luca. traveled with you, but n never was seen on the camera?" Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> a while he came up, became a second character. But like when we did Around the World, that was one camera person and camera, sound, editing at night. So the whole idea is like wow. three pieces of content a week we would create, like five minute episodes. So we, I would, you know, whatever happened one day, it would get edited that night, delivered the next day for the audience now to interact. So it was fully interactive. I got a friend down in Colombia and. They can help you get to Venezuela, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's Jolt Luca. And I can't remember. Uh, oh, because I always had the story that I remember someone in Jacksonville, Florida saying, oh, it's easy for you to travel. You made money. And I was like, oh, I could make it around the world with no money. That's how I remember the beginning of this idea. But Jolt reminded me. He goes, Alex, remember. So if I, if, I'll tell the audience this. I'm shooting this surf documentary um, in El Salvador. They had given us uh, two security, the, the tourism board or the government. And anyway, while we're there, all hell breaks loose. I'm talking about tornado erupts, like something else happens. The whole country is just like up in flames. It's, it's a bad situation. So like, we need your security. We don't want you leaving here, a very dangerous area. Uh, we're down near La Libertad at the beach. Um, they're like, please keep your whole crew in here. We'll talk to you guys in a couple of days when we get through like mudslides and all everything that's happening in this country. So, you know, after a couple of days, Everyone's getting anxious. It's like we're just sitting in this hotel. And there's this favela up, up on the hillside. And everyone's like, don't go up there. Like, if you guys go up there, you'll die. And I remember being like, I'll die? Like, everyone's like, yeah, you'll die. And I was just like, why would they, why would, why would they, why would I die? And they're like, you don't understand. Like, just don't go up there, you'll die. So it's fascinating that everyone kept telling me I'll die. And I was like, I don't understand. Like, what, just because I'm going to die up there? Like, I, it doesn't even make any sense to me. And so Joel, and Jolt's like crazier than me. And Jolt's like, yeah, why don't I grab a, you want to just go up there? I'll grab a camera. And I was just like, okay. I was like, I'm down. And so Joel, so I just walk up to this. I have no plan. I'm just like, I'm just going to walk up there and see if I die or not. <laughs> so Jolt's following me with the camera. And next thing you know, this people start coming out of their house and like, hola. And like, just the nice people in the world. And they're just poor. They're not like, it's not dangerous. It's just like, just different demographics. And, then, and this family invites me to their house. They had a stove, uh, um, this trash can that was cut in half. That was their stove. And so now I'm inside the favela and just seeing the labyrinth of homes. It was so cool. And we're up close to just filming this thing. And so Joel's right. I mean, we were did that. And we're like, how cool would it be to do that around the world? Like that is, that's real people. That's real yeah. life right there. And no one ever sees that stuff, right? Like the realness. And the only way you really get to do it is by living with people. It's the only way it, to really see it. Because if you, it, it doesn't matter how awesome the travel show is. Are you really living with the person? You know, it's like it, it, something's being set up to do this or that. Here it's like just letting like, you know, basically couch surf your way around the world. And that was around the world for free. And so that was, so that is, Joel's correct. That was like the genesis of the idea. And, um, you know, technology had just gotten to the point where we thought we could pull it off. And, you know, yeah, we did three seasons of that. But you did... 56 countries, is that right? Um, let's see. 56,000 miles. I want to say 16 countries, 
45,000 miles is what I, I'm trying to think of the trailer in my head because I say it. But I think, I think it was like 16, because we went, I left from New York City through the East Coast of the US, through the Caribbean, some great stories down the Caribbean. Um, you mentioned St. John's earlier. Yeah, because I used to live down in St. John. That was fun. But there was, yeah, there was a point when I got a boat ride from St. John. I, mean, I could tell stories forever on this, but I got a boat ride from St. John and they were going to drop me off in Tortola, which is in the British Virgin Tortola. Islands, right? BBI. So when I get past customs, I'm sitting there. I don't know who's, you know, half the time you're kind of getting dropped off somewhere and you'll see what, sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. And there's a thousand stories like that. But I get there and all of a sudden this woman's like, you Alex? And she got the British accent. I was like, yeah. She's like, all right, let's go talk to some schools. And so like, they thought I was like a motivational speaker, but they put me up in a little hotel. They're like, you're the motivational speaker. And I was like, well, okay, cool. sounds good. <laughs> and I was like, and so like, yeah, no problem. So they gave me a jolt little hotel room. And for like two days, they just took us around speaking to all these kids. And so it's just kind of, it's like a part of the show. It's like, I actually the motivational speaker this week. And so anyway, we traveled through, um, didn't I, re didn't I remember you were someplace where a, a, a riot broke out or a... Oh, well, we, we were in Kenya when the uh, the government turned. I mean, and I, I remember earlier on that week, we were just talking the Kenyan people are so lovely uh, and just amazing. But we're now, we're, we're now in Nairobi about to take off. Government turned and I mean, it became mass genocide. I mean, the whole... Yeah. I mean, I have, I have, we have footage. I'm walking down Nairobi streets in Nairobi at night, and all it is is like National Guard. I get, uh, I get put to. Uh, there's a park there called Haru Park. So this becomes international news very quickly. So we do have CBS Early Show checking in with us once or twice a week. But when this happens, they they want to check in with me a lot more because right? <laughs> I'm in the thick of this. They're like, oh my gosh, Alex, is, Alex is over there. So we set up to do this like semi live hit from Haruru Park. So when we show up there, there's all, all kinds of other media there. There's Sky News, there's CNN, whatever. And around you, it is, I mean, it is, you're just, how am I going to get out of here? It's just smoke and it's like war zone around here. And they were just trying to protect Nairobi. I mean, the government's trying to protect Nairobi. The only way to even get in there is someone from a news station had been following us, said, hey, I can help you guys. So now I'm living with this guy who runs this little small little newspaper. And he's like, you can't, you, you know, we, I would never know the difference, but they'll know the difference between different tribes in, in Kenya. They're like, oh, she's from that tribe. She'll be able to get in there without, you know, getting, getting injured. If you're from the wrong tribe, there, it's a massive fight going on. So I'm walking with that. She's a reporter. She's like, I mean, she's like 17 years old. She's a reporter for a tiny newspaper in Kenya. And she's like, I'll bring you in there. So I'm walking with her along. Jolt's just, and she's just, she's like, I've never been scared. For, I can remember. I can remember what she was saying. She's like, I've never been scared for my country before. I can't believe this. Like, oh, bomb goes off over here. It was, it was hairy. And so while we're, while I, I have this weird thing where when things get weird or uncomfortable or dangerous, I smile. It's not a good trait I have. I have no <laughs> idea why. But now I'm down in the Zubaru Park. This is not good, what's happening. It's not good for anyone. But it's just my nature. So now I'm doing this live hit, whether it's to CBS or doing a stand-up for Joel. I don't know, but I'm, I'm smiling the whole time. I'm like, you guys would not believe this. This is crazy. And so I'm delivering whatever's happening that I'm seeing. After that, all the reporters, like four reporters came over to me, pissed. They're like, you're so disrespectful. They're like, how would you ever report like this? And I'm like, dude, I'm just doing the show called Ramon Free. It's, my, it's who I am. It was like, <laughs> so all the reporters are seeing me do this thing. And they're like, who smiles during this stuff? It was like, anyway, I'll never forget that. Yeah. And so, and, and there's stories go on and on like that. It was just, yeah. it's the most, it so is, it, there's no way you can work on Ramon for Free and not change your life. And that goes for, you know, we had two other Season two, Jeff Schroeder, he's a big brother. CBS wanted, CBS came in and bought the, basically the franchise from me. And I stayed on producing it. Jolt stayed on making it, stayed at the same team, but they always wanted an ex CBS reality star. So that was kind of like the bit. And so season two was Jeff Schroeder from Big Brother. Um, and you guys should have him on here. Jeff's great. And then season three was Poverty. She wasn't Survivor. And so we had a girl do it the third time. And each one of them, are, it's a different journey. I kind of have a style because it's my style. Jeff had a different style. Poverty had a different style. But throughout all those three seasons, and I would say, I mean, mine's because it's so raw and we were figuring out the show. There's a magic to that of just, you just didn't, we were getting really good at making the show by season two and season mm -hmm. three. Um, but I'm going to tell you, Poverty season, 
that girl pushed the envelope. I mean, we were in Haiti, saw some crazy stuff in Haiti. We went up to Dadaab in uh, Somalia. She really wanted it's the largest refugee camp in the world. Super dangerous place. Oh my god! Only way to get in is through like big NGOs. So the Red Cross is like, we'll Humvee. So we got Hummers. Drove like two hours to this this place, and when you're inside there, someone from the Red Cross had gotten killed like two days ago because it's you're in you're in dangerous extreme terrorist territory. Like you are, even though you're inside the 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 camp, it's 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 heavy. And so we're there. AT and T's the sponsor. So now we're and they're like, we have to move every 15 minutes. People are gonna know we're here and we gotta go. So we would come in. I would stay outside just so I'm so nervous. I'm like, I cannot have anyone die. You know what I mean here? And so I'm I'm nervous. She must have been smiling like a uh, yeah, I'm smiling like I yeah, <laughs> <laughs> weird. It's like, smile what, is what is about wrong it? with me. Yeah, it's like and poverty's in a tent with Joel. They're filming a story because these stories are horrific. People are leaving Mogadishu and being like, I left you know, two of my kids on the side of the desert that I, that I couldn't make it with them. And I brought one. I mean, it's, it's horrible what's going on there. And so poverty is sitting there because AT&T, we had these phones that worked anywhere in the world. So poverty, I mean, the best integration for AT&T, people hadn't talked to their families. So we're like handing phones over for them to call back to their families. Anyway, it's around the world for free. It's can, story after story after story. Where can you watch it? it can, is it available any, on any? No, it's a really good question. I don't know where you can watch it anymore we it's something that joel has been talking about like it's been uh I mean, he has his hands full he's part of college tour as well but i don't know where you can watch can it can you right not now. youtube it we, we, probably could youtube there's probably a lot on youtube there's probably, probably a lot on youtube there, right? but we yeah let me, let me ask you you said you had to move every 15 minutes because it was so dangerous in, in what respect like these people were obviously hungry they're refugees Extremist ter extreme terrorists are going to come there to just to kill you to make some noise exactly like oh, i want to i want to kill a foreigner you know what i mean like, i don't want them here and Exactly. Yeah. So like you're just, you're in that territory. You're in that, you're in that extremist territory where it's just like, oh yeah, if there's an American here. Oh, I want their head. You know? Wow. Really, really. Heavy. Heavy. Super and heavy. And you know what? I love the, 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 the byline, I guess, and lived his way around the world. Why sure. you bullshitted your way around the world? What you did? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was really, <laughs> and, and you know, when we left, imagine when we, I mean, there was a lot, right? We had gotten Anne O'Grady. She was the VP of marketing at CBS, massive influence on getting the show off the ground because she was the one who saw this and said, you know, uh, if you want a funny story, I'll tell you. I mean, Burton and I had heard probably 250 no's for over a, a year and a half trying to get this show off the ground. Um, everyone kept saying no. Anne we're, we're in New York for a meeting. Anne O'Grady, who is um, very high up running marketing at CBS, we get a meeting with her. Um, and first, we went to like, the wrong CBS buildings or so many CBS buildings in New York like four times. So she's about to leave the office. She's like, what are you guys doing? And like, we're like, we're coming. She's like, you're at the wrong building again. Anyway, we get in there. And <laughs> These guys are going to find their way around the world. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> and can't find a way to CBS. Can find a yeah. <laughs> this is right, yeah, this is pre like, you know, Google Maps and all that. But anyway, so we we walk in there. It's like Friday, 530. No one's there. And it's Ann in, this, in the corner office. Waiting and so and and she's like one of my closest friends now. But back then we were we were just kind of knew each other from from a little reality TV. And so <laughs> Bert and I walk in. We got we got our little sizzle reel on an old DVD. We got our decks printed out. And she's like, "Are you guys pitching me something?" And Bert and I are like, uh, yeah, "Why?" And she's, I, "Guys, I you can't pitch me." She's like, "I'm marketing. You have to go talk to Gen Madarn over at you know at development." I'm like, "Well." Gen said no to us twice. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, well, Gen's already said no. And so she, I go, we haven't met with Gen. She's like, okay. She's like, throw it in. And so she goes, throw the DVD in. And so we throw the DVD in and she's watching this. And like 20 seconds goes by and she's like, why isn't CBS doing this? And I'm like, ah, that's what we're saying. That's what we're saying. And she, and she looked and she goes, what do you guys want? What do you guys need? And at this point, we're over trying to get money for the show. We're over that. We're like, is there a way we can get like the CBS early some marketing to follow us? And she's like, I'll get you a meeting with the executive producer of the CBS early show. She's like, give me a week. So that, so she's like, I'll make that happen. Like I like this idea. I, I can't get in the middle of development. I could go. So she walks us in a week later into the executive producer's office of CBS early show. I wish I remembered his name. But it just felt as old school as it gets. I think he had a cigar, Stogie. <laughs> and he's sitting there. Bert and I are, I mean, I'm, I don't know, 27 years old. And, you know, he's like, 
uh, what, do you, what do you guys got? You know what I mean? And so we do our whole dog and pony show. Like, he's just like, all right, I'm going to go around the world, blah, blah, blah. And he's sitting there and he's kind of like sitting, and he just rolls back in his chair. I, didn't, I remember just like taking a puff. And he's like, you guys got it, kid. Never been a stunt. I don't like. You got it. And that was it. <laughs> That's a perfect guy. And that was it. And that was it. And then it was just like, you got it. And they, they kind of committed to, you know, checking in with us once a week. And, and for Burton and I, that was like, that was enough. We were like, okay, forget, you know, we had talked to every sponsor up and down. We're like, forget it. We're, let's just go make this show and, and figure it out. So we kind of self-funded it. I mean, fortunately we weren't paying for travel because it was for free and that was part of the show. Um, and so we had to, you know, figure some stuff out with Joel and different things, but we got to, we bootstrapped that thing. And that was halfway down, halfway. So I'm no, about a third of the way through the trip. I am down in Peru. Burton had a meeting with Ed Wilson. Do you remember that name? He, he used to, he ran, I think, NBC, but he was running WGN America at the time. He was connected with SMU where Burton went to school. And Burton was back at the school speaking about around the world for free at, at like a something. And he's there. And so that was the first. So we're down there and he's like, hey, could you guys turn this into television? He's like, could you guys take all this stuff, and put it in TV? I'll, I'll take it over. You know, you got to come pitch my guys. But that was a, so everything happened from around the world for free. That happened. Um, we, we, I got a call from Shane Farley, a really good friend of mine. He was running the rate to ratio at the time. And so all these people were kind of watching. We were, at, we were on the radar of a lot of people, which I think was, which was really but nice. But you didn't know it. I, yeah, I don't know. I don't, yeah, I don't know who's watching. You know, I mean, I think some people that I know, I hope are people are watching, yeah. but it's like, you know, we're, but you realize that people are, it's good. Life lesson. People are watching. We, uh, I get a call from, I get a call from, uh, I get a call from Shane and he goes, Hey, this is awesome. Can you do that exact same thing for the Rachel Ray show? And so that's what that we did, you know, virtual around the world for free with Rachel Ray on her show afterwards. And yeah. Travel Channel called and said, hey, we're doing this thing. We're mapping the globe. We want to do two minute videos in every city in America. Can you guys handle? So that one idea, that one idea is the, the beginning of the next chapter of my career because of just taking that risk and going for it. And it was the it stills the most fun I've ever had doing a show. There's nothing I, and I don't think anyone who's ever touched around the world for free could say they've worked on something that was, you just didn't know where you're going to, you didn't know where you're going to stay the next night. And you eventually you just start trusting in the universe and trusting in people around the world. And when you do that, it works. Well, no one here for 25 years. It's been a fun, a fun adventure watching you grow. Yeah. And your career grow. I know Derek's been scribbling some notes down on the page. You got some things you want to ask Alex? Yeah. The first question is, uh, do you think the world is friendlier now? or uh, less friendly or now? I, I think in general, and I, I made this, and, and Around the World Free does it great. I, I, part of me wants to do Around the World for Free because that was coming after 9-11, which kind of changed the psyche of the world a little bit. You know, uh, I think we're all, I think it's the same. I think the 99.9% .9 of the population are good people and they just want to, they want to share a meal with someone. They want to open their home. And, and usually the, the more poor someone is, the more open and the more like giving they are of like their own food. I think that's an interesting thing. And I think I, you'd see that time and time again. And unfortunately, I think it's the the media that divides all us all and just puts all this fear into everybody. No, I don't think, I mean, I'm, I'm living proof that you can go to some of the craziest places on this planet and people are going to welcome you with open arms. That's awesome. That's a great message too, especially for somebody message. who has, yeah. uh, has the experience. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I think, I think it's a, it's a big misnomer out there. I think if people yeah. think that like, Oh, we're different cultures. It's like, yeah, we're all humans. You know, I'm not saying it's not problems on the planet. We're we're all, yeah. but in general. And then, how many shows do you think? How many shows do you think you have uh, pitched over the years? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> great question. That's a great question. <laughs> I would. Well, you know what I say all the time: less than one percent of my ideas ever ever you, anyone's ever ever seen them. So, uh, I'm probably I probably sold ten ideas would be my guess in it. You know, in my career. And so w hundreds, <laughs> hundreds of pitches. If I, if, if I could have had my old computers or like, and, and kept every one of them, that would be a fascinating thing to do. Just printed one of those out. Hundreds of ideas. Didn't we come up with an idea once, uh, like the, the race, Columbus, the race to America. We were, we were trying to figure where something some, like where, this where out. They would, they would build replicas of the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. Absolutely. Give them all the same 
supplies and everything else. I think that'd still be fun. I yeah, think that's so great too. Idea. But it's it, a great idea. Yeah. It probably cost millions of dollars to produce. Yeah, yeah. It was like yeah, it was the, the the idea of like go back and give someone today the what they had back then and make them do the exact same thing. It's yeah. almost like have, the Lewis Lewis and Clark. Feet? What's maybe 29, 30 feet? Those boats. That's all they were. They were, were they? They were tiny boats. Oh my gosh! Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, that's a great concept. Wonderful. There you go. There's another one there. Thousand. <laughs> yeah. thousand one, that, one that at the time we knew we were going to sell it. Yeah. <laughs> we were sell it. What, what was your What was your hardest pitch? Uh, like what What was that your worked most... or did not work? I you know I would prefer did not work. Work okay. did not work because I well I I, I a better question would be because I'm sure there's some ideas that you're married to. Like you when you came up with the concept, you were you thought it was a home run and then when it wasn't when it didn't hit it probably was heartbreaking so yeah or yeah. maybe not it's a great you know and i wish like i have this weird i only remember good things oh that's and good I, I found this out like even when i got casted for amazing race like i don't i like somehow forget the all the bad oh, and that's that's good. i think that's how I'm able to get, i think that's how i've gotten through this business because there's so many no's and so many negativity so it's so funny i'm sure there's a i sure there's so many Two ideas. One I thought was awesome, and I don't want to say I was married to it because I, to me, it's like all the you know this business is tough, and usually when you get a little success and around the world for free, for sure, that was something I saw. I knew how we were going to make it, and and I just knew it was going to work. And honestly, I feel like that about College Tour too. Like as soon as it started going, I just I knew. I remember early on telling telling everyone's like, let's this is going to go, and I remember. Everyone's like, don't call it a unicorn. Don't say anything. I'm like, I know it's going to work. I knew I knew it from the first like few phone calls. You know, you can kind of get a sense that like this model. But many shows, there was a show I created called Snakes on Sunset. And it was so cool. It was this company. It was a reptile business in Miami Beach. Because in Miami, and just, just shooting the pilot. You know, they're right outside of Miami Airport. There is like warehouses full of every type of reptile you could possibly imagine, like green vipers from the Amazon, everything. Yeah. And in Miami, everything can live in Miami. So there's so many invasions, invasive species. And I don't know if you know what's happening, like the, the Python problem in the Everglades. Yeah. You go into the world of reptiles in Miami, it's fascinating. So these guys ran this reptile shop and they did everything. They would buy, they'd go and buy like, you know, exotic animals. Half the time, they'd be getting phone calls throughout the day. Be like, I got a python that's wrapped around my chicken in my backyard. Like, what do I do? <laughs> and then they would, and then they would like be selling these things on the back. And so I was, and so I went down there with one. I'm trying to remember who I was shooting. Wasn't Joel? Someone went down. I grabbed some camera. Someone was down there was shooting it. And I spent a week, and I was like, oh, this is too good. I mean, I was in the back alley of this this reptile shop, and that someone's selling a komodo dragon thing this, this huge like out of the back of someone's truck i mean so the world that i was like exposed to i was like this thing's selling it's gold i mean i'm walking <laughs> to some lady's backyard she's screaming because it's a python like wrapped around her chicken or dog or something i'm like this is and then they would take that python that they just caught and say charge you money okay cool i picked up your python you owe me like 200 dollars. i got a python in your backyard and then turn around and sell it for like 500 bucks to somebody else you want a python so these guys just had it down i was convinced i'd sell it never could sell it and there were characters too so oh, no imagine. kidding character yeah. imagine no in kidding. florida but you couldn't uh so I, I was i was i was like there's no way this is that was one of those ones, there's no way this is not selling and then no one would touch it with a 10-foot pole wow. like i ain't getting into like PETA and all these things like i ain't oh, getting yeah, it. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah no yeah, one yeah. would touch it no one would touch the show I, yeah i know frank is gonna get an itchy over there but uh I, a couple more questions so in the world What's your favorite place you've ever been to since you've been to so many places? That is the best question, hardest. But if I had to pick one place, for someone who, it all depends, what, do you, what does someone want? Because that's another, it's, you know, there's so many places in the world, right? So, but if I was going to say, if you want to travel and you haven't really explored that much outside the world, so you want that exotic experience, but somewhat still in a safe environment, go to Thailand. I knew uh, say go to Thailand. It's, it's just, it's like the, the culture's, they're just busting all around you. It's you got islands, you got mountains. The people are friendly. It's cheap, so you got so much going on. And so, I mean, there's many places I could send people to that are crazy. There, there's a there is a place, Guyana, mm. in the middle of Guyana. That's a country in the northern part of South America. Okay, so you're kind of like east of Venezuela. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. You have like Surrey name and all that. Anyway, this, we had to do that in third season of Around the World Free. I could tell stories for Around the World Free all day long, but we're now, we land there. Someone is knows that we're there and is trying to get us through this. Half of it is like Amazon jungle. It's like impenetrable forest. And so it's, uh, but in the middle of this, they're like, you got to see Kaichir Falls. Here are, everyone should Google who's listening to us. Re- Google Kaichir Falls, Guyana. This is where the Amazon just falls away. It's the largest single drop waterfall on planet Earth. And it's massive and nobody's there. And so if you can get there, you will be the only person. I have a picture, like with my arms like out at that falls. Um, we, me, Jolt, and Poverty, and whoever got us in there are lit. And except for the Amazon, you know, tribes that are out there. I didn't see any, but there, there's people who live, you know, natives that live out there. But so that is a, that's probably the most spectacular place that I sat there. And I was like, man, our planet is awesome. Not one, I know a lot of people who have traveled to a lot of places and no one knows about this place. Yeah. So you think of how many other places on planet earth that are like that. I got a feeling Derek will have that up on the, uh, on the post. On, on I the can post. pull it up now, but, uh, no, don't pull that's it up really now. cool. Yeah. It's super cool. And I love Thailand. I spent the year there and I couldn't agree with you more. I think yeah. it's just great. Yeah, I, I like the dive. Yeah, well, you wouldn't want to go to the places that he's been. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, let's not go there, Frank. <laughs> I was in it for the scenery, Frank, just yeah. the scenery. <laughs> Sun and section. <laughs> Billy, any final thoughts? No, man, just a, a delight to talk to you as always. And, uh, and as a fellow uh, wanderer, uh, I'm awed with the planet Earth as well. But uh, I certainly wish I took as big a bite out of it as you did. Well, I'm going to give you a last chance to put in a plug for your sister. Oh, Alexis. Yeah, yeah. my little thanks, Frank. I appreciate that. Yeah, both my sisters now. They're, the, they're you know, they're now they're rebranded, which I'm, I've been saying for them to do this for years. They're now the Boylan sisters. Yep. Like, brand yourself. Um, movie makers, yeah, filmmakers. yeah, faith based filmmakers. They found once again, they they're someone who uh, I like. I mean, Frank knows my my youngest sister, she's when I was out here at 19, humping it, hustling, and then her and my older sister connected and they started making faith based films and have really found the right niche, the right market, and they're they're killing it. They're doing about a, a film or two, uh, a year now, and I think Inheritance just came out, I believe, and um, there's another one switched. Wish for Christmas. They just they got a nice yeah. They got going. about five or six movies out. Yeah, and yeah. and you're married within the last year, year and a half. Can you believe it? Can you believe Can it? Can you believe it? Can you believe someone married me? <laughs> yeah, we got married. Thank God, we actually got married the the summer before COVID. And happened. what's your name? Katie Erlinson. Yeah, from Virginia. Um, yeah, her dad was a lieutenant colonel, and uh, she said she was a little military brat. She's then, sure. like uh, Pentagon, DC, kind of grew up in the DC area, so. Um, yeah, great. Comes from a great family. We uh, we met later in life, but weirdly, we have like a million mutual friends. As any, you know, I guess how LA works. But mm-hmm. we're starting to date. We put a connection together that her two best friends from high school were both on Amazing <coughs> Race. One of them was roommates with Burton. I have zero recollection of this, and all of a sudden, she's showing me pictures. <coughs> On like Sunset in like Saddle Ranch or Cabo Cantina, me with her friends, you know, all like 10 years ago. So yeah, so she, she's awesome. And she puts up with my antics and being gone all the time. She probably likes that actually. <laughs> well, we wish you nothing but su- continued success in your life and in your marriage and, and everything else. Uh, well, I love you, Frank. It's, it's been- good to be here. Thank you, Billy. Thank Go you. Every- thank Go you. And, and anytime you want me to come rattle off you know anytime you need to burn some air <laughs> airways I'm, I'm here great thank you so much thank really you guys been great Take care, brother yeah delight with that we'll sign off for you want to sign off frank say yes, goodbye sir. to everybody say don't goodbye. forget say goodbye derek goodbye derek goodbye derek <laughs> the voice next week's guest actor of head of the class and keenan and kel dan frischman 